Welcome back to the She Does This podcast. I'm Geordie Lucas. I hope you've had an amazing week. Ours has been uneventful, but my toddler's woken up with a cold this morning, so we're on strict rest at the moment because we've got the Wiggles concert this weekend, which I am so excited for. Is anyone else in Melbourne going? I feel like I have an unhealthy obsession with the Wiggles. I've spoken about this on my Instagram before. I am just obsessed with them. If you just have a spare five minutes in your day, have a little Google about who's dating who, who's been with who in the in the Wiggles clan. It's quite fascinating. Anyway, this week I want to talk about the guilt that we allow ourselves to take on as women. It is such a common theme among all the conversations and all the women that I speak to, whether we're mums or not, we feel that it's our responsibility to please everyone and to keep everyone happy. I know for me, when my partner comes home from a bad day at work, I feel like it's my job to fix it or make him feel better. And it's not. Like, Why do we do this to ourselves? Why, why do we feel that it's our responsibility to keep everyone happy? And it's often to our own detriment because when I then focus on me and protect my energy, I feel selfish. You know, how do we break this cycle? Because it's something that I know that we all do. This is something that I touch on with our guest this week, Tina Nettlefold, who walked away from a high-flying career in advertising to focus on raising her three boys. But she lost who she was and her identity along the way. And I think this is something that as mothers, we all go through. We pour so much energy into our kids that we forget who we are. I've certainly felt lost and uncertain of who I am since having Evie, but I've realized that I need to stop holding on to that old version of myself and just accept this new version of Geordie because motherhood changes you. It changes fundamentally who you are. It causes a shift in priorities. It's just inevitable. When your child becomes the focus though, We can't forget ourselves along the way. And I know when I ignore my own needs that I'm not as patient as I need to be. We all know the patience that we need when we have young people and and toddlers to look after. But then on the other hand, I'm just filled with guilt whenever I do leave for work or drive away for a few hours of me time. So it's this constant battle. But I just have to remind myself that doing these things make me a better mum and a better partner. And that is really important. So let's get to this week's guest, Tina Nettlefold. This woman has done it all. She reached the pinnacle of the advertising game at just 29. But she walked away from it all when she had her three children. And we talk about how her and her husband moved overseas to build an empire, but lost everything, all their money twice and had to rebuild their lives. Tina also shares her latest venture, her not-for-profit organization, Tea House, which is doing incredible things for Aussie kids and how you can help. Here's my chat with Tina Nettlefold. Tina, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast this week. Very excited to hear all about your life and career and Tea House. Tell me about your life before this venture. What was your career and, and family life like? Thank you very much for having me. I feel very honoured to be on the show. I have had a multitude of careers, actually, and I'm a big believer that um, as women we can have any number of careers and we can change it up as much as you like. So I started off actually being in the banking industry. I was one of the first females to be on the stock exchange back in the 80s uh, with a company called BT Australia, and I was very fortunate to have a, a wonderful mentor who thought that women should be a little bit more present in the finance industry. Mm. Um, But I'd always have an earning when I was, you know, um, at school that I wanted to be in advertising. Don't ask me what it was, but it was just a little bit like, oh, this sounds very glamorous. Uh, But like a lot of these glamorous jobs, they're not really that glamorous. And I decided, uh, well, I was married then, not to my current husband, but to someone else. And he was a bit older than me. And he said, listen, you must follow your passion and follow your dream. Never give up on that. Mm. Uh, Because if you don't have a go when you're young, you're never going to have a go. And I seem to have had that philosophy all my life. So I applied for an Australian Federation scholarship with the advertising industry. And I was 
given a scholarship to work with a wonderful creative agency um, and I kind of went up the ladder that way. I unfortunately divorced and, you know, followed my career right through until I became a, uh, a media director with an advertising agency called Merchant and Partners and was given some wonderful opportunities to work on some major accounts. I then followed a love down to Melbourne. Mm-hmm. and went to work with a wonderful agency called Campaign Palace, which you probably know about too. And within eight months of being in Melbourne um, and following this man who dumped me six weeks before my second wedding, <laughs> okay, that is just, you know, the life that I've had. But anyway, I, um, I decided that I would just focus on my career, not worry about marriage. And I was very fortunate I was approached by Lintest Australia at the time. They were one of the top agencies. Mm-hmm. They had Honda, I don't know if you remember, a, a, um, um, a great big department store called Daimaru. They were huge in Melbourne Central. They yeah. were a big Japanese store. And I was given a media directorship and a media strategist role. So I was actually the youngest female media director in the country at the time. And how old so, were you at that point? 29 years old. You've gone through so <laughs> much. It just Yeah, so two different careers. Moved to the I hadn't moved in a lot of agencies, not a lot like a lot of young people do these days. Um, my dad always used to say to me, the only way to make it up the ladder is through hard work. So mm. if you really want to make it, you just got to work harder than everybody else does. Mm. And also, my dad was a big believer in it doesn't matter what you know, female, male, whatever you want to be, you know, you can do it, you can do anything you want, you just got to apply yourself. Because I used, we used to photocopy in those days, of course, no yeah. one photocopied anymore. And they were all the presentations that used to go out to all the um, clients and big presentations they used to do those days. They were very flash, it was very advertising in those days, it was all about the big lunches and, you know, yeah. um, being sort of wooed by clients and wooed by media and all sorts of things. So um, I used to was given the job of photocopying hundreds of pages. So, you know, I used to do when I used to wait for that machine, zero percent. I used to mm. read the documents from start to finish. And I used to yeah. ask first, was I allowed to? And they said, of course. And I learned so much just by being attentive and and just putting in, I was one of the last to always leave in the office and make sure that, you know, everything was clean and done. Yeah. And, and I think through those hard work ethics that my dad had taught me, it had taught me that people notice and they give you an opportunity to advance yourself. Yeah. So I've been fell in love again. <laughs> <laughs> so I am the endless romantic, I think. Yeah. Even though I vowed never to fall in love again and to just get on with my career and really make it to the top. This time, my gorgeous husband, who is now, we're now 30 years married. We just had our anniversary and we have three. Congratulations. Kids. Thank you so much. Um, his family is the Nettlefold family and they were in billboards. And my husband still is in billboards. And he had a dream. Of, so I was at the top of my career, Pinnacle. Mm. He was working with his in his father's company, kind of cruising, going to the gym twice a day. I'm working till midnight, working my ass off. Yeah. Like kind of a role reversal. He used to cook dinner for me and bring it in while I was sort of working on pitches and all sorts of things. Uh, and he said to me, look, I really want to go to Asia and start a business there. I want to open a billboard company in Malaysia. We have a great opportunity. Yeah. Would you leave your career behind and follow me? And So this is like history repeating itself. Someone yeah. asked, a man asking you to follow them for love. Yes. And I had done it before, but, yeah. you know, that was... But we were married, but we'd only been married for two months. And here I was at the top of my position, like, Mm. you know, Lintas was saying, we're grooming you to go to New York and we want you to go and stay there for a couple of months and do all this sort of stuff, like all the things that people work towards. And I'm still only, I only had just turned 30. So I was pretty young to make it to the top of where I was. Mm. Um, And my husband said, come on, you can do it. I'm sure you'll get a job over there. We sold everything. We sold our house. We owned a house together. Like all the things and all our friends looked at us and said, you are crazy. What are you doing selling all this and moving mm. across? I was very fortunate. Lintas got me a job at Lintas Malaysia. We invested very heavily in a company over there. Well, we went broke. We got ripped off massively. We lost everything. Our houses we lost every every single cent we put in and we were thrown out of the country as well. So that 
is yes I know oh so here God. I was I left an amazing job uh when we were thrown out of the country that was really devastating at that stage we were trying to have children so my husband said we're going to go to Indonesia we've got a partnership there that we can work um with we went to Malaysia I got an amazing job with as media director of McCann Ericsson's yep. which was another big advertising agency they had Coca-Cola they had General Electric they had some amazing accounts so I learned to speak Indonesian as part of my job Salamat uh, I, Puggy Salamat <laughs> Puggy Salamat that done. So like, <laughs> anyway so <laughs> learned to speak Indonesian and I fell pregnant with one of with our twins so I had twins. Oh, twins but I kept I kept working there and um anyway long story short we ended up being there for 10 years and then we hit what's called the Suharto regime downfall. You probably don't know this, but you're probably too young. But Suharto was in power. He was overthrown and it was um, we were evacuated out of the country by the Australian government and that was the end of my career. Wow. And a year later we went. We took a sabbatical. My husband's business closed down for four months until mm-hmm. things, the, the government all got everything settled, new people came into power. We went to, um, with our children, we went to Europe and lived in Europe for four months, which was just a fabulous thing to do. Yeah. And went back into Indonesia and 12 months later, nearly 12 months later, we decided that my children needed, I decided my children needed to come back to Australia and that my husband would travel. Well, that yeah. was the start of another career. And that's the hardest career I've ever had. Coming back to Australia whilst was fabulous Mm. I came back to Melbourne I'm a Sydney girl originally so I had none of my Greek family here to help me my husband's family they were busy they were still working his parents everyone and yeah it was hard because we ended up selling our Australian business but he kept the Asian business so that means for 10 years I was a single parent more or less he would, and I would say they were the hardest 10 years of my life. So they were mm. in my 40s um, and coming into my 50s. So at that stage, I thought I, if I was to come back and go back into the advertising industry and try and do that, I would need a full-time nanny or an au pair or, mm. you know, someone I would rely on. Um, and I just didn't want to do that. It's probably my Greek background that yeah. I decided that I wanted to be a stay-at-home mum and make that my career. Well, yeah. I think being a mum is the hardest career in the world. It's very oh, difficult. Yeah, yeah very, it's really hard. Very, very hard. I found working a lot easier than being a full-time stay-at-home mum. What made it hard too was my husband was travelling Monday to Friday. He'd, he'd always try and get on a plane on Friday and be back on the weekend, but he'd be back on the plane on a Tuesday or Wednesday and be travelling back and forth for nearly 10 years of our life. Mm. On top of that, my twins, who were extremely talented sports people, ended up becoming quite elite swimmers. But that meant my life was starting at 4.30 in the morning mm. and really my day would not finish until 9pm at night. Yeah. So that would have to have been probably the toughest years of my life. Yeah. Probably also the most um, least social time in my life. I was going to say it it sounds quite, forgive me if this isn't the right word to use, but it sounds a bit lonely. I was very Your husband's travelling for work and and you're living and breathing your children, but where's your, where are you filling your cup? Yeah. Nowhere, nowhere. I was nobody at that stage. Mm. I was going to the school and actually being... I became, obviously, eventually I ended up becoming part of the school parent-teacher thing and, you know, you do, you, you know, we would do valedictory day and we do cupcakes at the carnival and mm. and that was, you know, and I used to find that very difficult because a lot of the women in those um, committees were, weren't were career women or maybe they were just younger, they were younger mums than me, I'm, mm. I'm, you know, uh, and not an older mum, but I had already had a big career. I was just looking to be involved and and be involved in my children's school um, because my day was filled with dropping kids at school, like, you know, dropping from swimming, coming home, feeding my kids um, at 7.30 in the morning. I'd stay up at 4.30 in the morning and cook my kids, you know, pancakes, bacon, you know, Mm. um, all this amazing food because I needed to fuel them up so they could think for the day. Yeah. Um, so my kids, I would drop them back at school at 8.30 in the morning and then I would go to the, you know, 
had to go to the gym because it was a thing you had to do. So, you know, flog myself again, you know, like mm. it was like that was that was how I thought about it. It's work. So go to the gym, maybe occasionally have a quick coffee with a girlfriend. Most of the time I'd still be in my gym gear, rushing to the supermarket, dropping off your dry cleaning, paying bills, yeah. coming home, unloading, turning Oprah on because she was my only <laughs> salvation. <laughs> <laughs> and then it would have to be right snacks have got to be ready and you'd pick up kids drop one off at swimming drop one off at soccer drop one off my kids did nearly anything and everything it was yeah. just we allowed them that because we wanted them to experience everything in their lives yeah um so I made a rod for my back but it was a rod that was quite lonely too because mm. at night the kids would go to bed at nine o'clock and I'd be there going I'm stuffed it was yeah. just nothing left to me. It, it took everything out of me. My husband says, you can't keep doing all this yeah. and that, yeah. you know, because when he came home, there was nothing left. Mm. I was just going, you want to go out? Are you kidding me? Yeah. I, you think I want to get dressed up and go out? I just want to watch TV and put my feet up with a cup of tea. So <laughs> I ended up becoming a very different person. Mm. It's very hard to juggle being a mum and a career person. And I do know by talking to a lot of young people these days, they, they're torn. I was torn. It yeah. was like if I go back to work, then I've got to have some stranger looking after my kid. If mm. I stay home and nurture my kids, then there's a part of me that goes, it's missing, yeah. Yeah. And I tell you the the the, the straw that really broke the camel's back for me with and, and it was a very difficult time for us in our marriage was when my husband rang me one day and I'm in the laundry doing my fifth load of washing because we had, you know, towels, school uniforms, you name it, it's all that sort of stuff. And he rang me and he goes, Oh hi, honey. He goes, I'm so excited. I go, Oh, why? And he goes, Oh, I'm having lunch with the king of Thailand. As you do. <laughs> And he goes, I've just been blessed by the monks. And I go, oh, fabulous. And he goes, and after that, we're going karaoke. I'm going, oh, yeah, whatever. I'm like, at this stage, I'm like, I don't give a shit, you know. Yeah. And he goes, oh, honey, how's your day? I said, are you fucking kidding me? Mm. Excuse my language. But it was, I said, I'm on my fifth load of washing. I've mopped the floors. I've cleaned the house. I've got to be out of here in an hour. Mm. And then crazy hour starts. Yeah. I said, are you really, really just asking me how much asking me? And he was so he felt so bad. And yeah. he said, I'm so sorry. But he was so excited. It wasn't his fault. He just wanted to share mm. the the experience. But I felt shallow and, and empty mm. that it was like that used to be my life, but I don't have that anymore. Yeah. So that to me was a very probably a very dark time, a very difficult mm. time. And he comes to the crux of eventually we get to my, I've got my youngest son who my oldest boys, you know, graduate with honours. I've got a, one of my boys was, you know, got the Humanities Awards, Sportsman's Awards. Mm. They've all done really well. And I remember I said to my husband, we own, we bought a couple of villas in Bali when we were living in Indonesia um, through our business. And one of them needed massive renovation. And I just looked at my husband, this was my son was doing year 11. I said, you know what? I said, you're not travelling as much now. Mm. I said, I need to go away. So I went away to Bali for five weeks and it was, and they were eventually, they were all coming across to, because it was June, July holidays and the kids were all going to come for three weeks holiday. I was yeah. going to see them, but I needed some space to breathe and I realised I needed some space to work out who am I because I was getting to a point of where I felt I was um, someone's mother, someone's mm. daughter. My father wasn't very well. I was always travelling to Sydney to look after him and help him out. Um, someone's wife, someone's cleaner, someone's nurse. But who I didn't know who Tina was. I'd forgotten that person back there and I kind of even, you know, lost my identity of what I was all about. Yeah. So by going away for five weeks, afforded me and working on this property and just really getting into it I rang a girlfriend and I said I really want to do something when I come back I really want to start to do something for Tina for a change mm. and I said but I don't know what to do because I don't want to go back to advertising by this stage mm. I was 53 years old yeah and a girlfriend of mine said why don't you just do what you do so well which is mm. renovate and style you're so good at it you do it for everyone for free you may as well yeah. just do it for everything so while I was there I then of course like a manic woman that I am which is how I approach <laughs> everything in my life 
I went, oh, okay. And then I started dreaming about products and I started designing, never knew how to draw before, draw. So I started taught myself how to draw handbags. I went to a factories and I, I made handbags, made cushions, and I started what's called Tea Concept Shop. So Tea Concept Shop is what it was called before Tea House. And okay. I have a beautiful little guest home that I designed for my parents to come and stay with me. Mm-hmm. But unfortunately, my dad's illness got worse and worse and it, we ended up not using it. So I yeah. thought, I'm going to turn that into my studio. So I designed all this product. Yeah. I got it all shipped to Australia. And then I rang all my friends and everyone. Yeah. I did my whole marketing thing, did flies <laughs> in the area. And I had an open day and everything got sold out. Wow. And next thing you know, I'm starting a shop. And then that's how it all sort of started. And then people would walk through my home and say, Can you come and have a look at my bedroom? I really love what you do. You know, Mm. like, can you? And I was taking on what I wanted to. I wanted to be a Lone Ranger. I didn't want to hire any extra staff. I just used casual staff. Um, I just wanted to be able to be flexible. and, And through my creativity, I started finding who Tina was about all over yeah. again and my voice changed even my husband says even my demeanor changed my happiness came to the forefront mm. because I was fulfilling a part of me that I had lost being someone's kid or yeah. people's caretaker for so long which is what I happens think, to yeah. us women oh yeah. I, I was just about to say it is such a common theme when I speak to women we put everybody before ourselves and we lose ourselves and I have an 18 month old daughter and what you have just said is like my life right now like torn between pursuing a career that I'm really passionate about and maintaining parts of me that when you fulfill those parts you're actually a better mother because you are fulfilled as a person but there is so much guilt that comes with putting yourself first absolutely absolutely and I don't know how you ever I don't know how us women ever get past that I really Mm. really don't the only thing I have learned and um through this is in 2020, when I started looking back, all I can say is I do not ever feel guilty or bad that I was a stay-at-home mum. Mm. I feel sad that I lost a little bit of myself through that time. Yeah. Um, I don't know how you ever fix that, but I can tell you one thing. I have three very successful, bright, respectful, kind, mm. loving men in my life that yeah. I have brought up and every day they walk into that room, my light, my heart just lights up. Yeah. So I know I did a good job. So what I ended up saying to myself at the time was, this is my job. Mm. It was my job. It was my job to be their mum and mm. to be there for them all the time. But that meant that when it is your job, you have to sacrifice something. And I unfortunately sacrificed myself mm. for the for them uh, even in their teenage years, and you will find this, if you really want to be there, I ended up sacrificing, we ended up, my husband and I ended up sacrificing our own social life mm. so that we could drop our kids to parties and be available to pick them up and drop them. We didn't want them. We were worried about driving, about mm. Ubers, about you name it. We we were the parents that were dropping off the kids in our bathrobes to yes. everyone's houses. But you just... I think for me it was a sense of uh, I wanted to make sure I was there for them mm. every single way. I'm glad I was. Yeah. So all I can say is it's never too late. So when I got to my 50s and I started Tea Concept Shop and everyone mm. loved what I was doing and it was a really um, fulfilling thing to realise, hey, okay, so I'm in my 50s. So what? Because people say, well, that's okay. You were at home with the kids. You just decided to have a new career. Yeah. So you basically can reinvent yourself. But it took a lot to back myself. There was a mm. lot of second guessing, a lot of um, am I good enough? Oh, yes. Am I really good at what I do? Yes. You know, when you're working in a, in a job like I was in advertising, I always had people say to me, you know, as I said, I had mentors, <laughs> you know, especially <laughs> being in advertising and you're presenting to clients and they're all going, oh, love it. Yeah. Love it is. But when you're on your own, and as you are probably yourself, yeah, you gotta, you gotta back yourself every day, mm. and you gotta say, no, I'm not a fraud. I'm, 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 I can do this. I'm, I'm okay. I can do this. And I think because I got to my fifties, that's when you really, as a woman, 
I've got to say is you really find yourself because yeah. in your in your twenties and thirties you need outside affirmation all the time, mm. even from your loved ones. In your in your thirties, if you do have babies, you need to be able to give a lot of yourself. So hopefully you get that back by the love that you get back from your children. Your children, yeah. But then when you get to your forties, then you try and please everyone. Then you want to yeah. be everyone's friend and you want to be everyone's, like you want to be like, I want to be involved in everything and I want to be everyone. And you need everyone to kind of go, yeah, you're in your 40s, but you you look amazing, girl. You're fine. You're cool. <laughs> well, then you get to your 50s and you say, you know what? I can say no. Yeah. I don't care anymore. And like me, I'm now just, I turned 60 last year. Now it's like, I don't give a fuck anymore. Yeah. I don't give a fuck anymore. <laughs> In 2020, for me, I think everyone's had a refocus, a relook, a refresh, maybe a relook at their lives. Yes. Um, it was a great opportunity for me to have a look and say, look, I love styling. I love doing what I'm doing. I've always done charity. Yeah. Everywhere in my life, I've always done charity. And I said to my husband, and he thought I was crazy, and I said, I want to rebrand myself because mm. I'm not a shop anymore. I don't want to have a shop anymore. Um, and I want to sort of design product to give to charities and he went what <laughs> you mean and he goes well give it all away and I go yeah give it all away so I think for me where it started was when the bush fires happened in Victoria I, mm. I I wasn't affected by it but as you know a lot of Victoria a lot of people were mm. um, my heart kind of went out to them I did a little bit of work with food bank where I would go in and help them you know pack boxes and and then I'd go around with my friends and we'd send boxes off to them and other charities because it was a really heartbreaking thing to see yeah and then all of a sudden we went into this into COVID and into lockdown mm. and I don't know something inside me just kind of went you know what, you don't need any more money. You really don't. you got more than enough. Yeah. Uh, your kids are set up for life. They've got great educations. Yeah. Um, two of my boys have moved out of home ages ago. I've done my work as a parent. What yeah. can I do? I wanted to do something to give back. Mm. And that's where Tea House Inception came about, yeah. where I thought, why don't I just share my passion for styling? Mm. And and I love it. I really do. Yeah. And cook healthy cooking tips and um uh, you know going in and talking to new shop owners and going oh I love this product and oh my god I get I get really excited about fashion and color and you know all yeah that thing. share it with everyone but in the meantime maybe design a product that I could give um uh, all the profits to a charity mm. and my heart's always been very strong with children yes children have always been a, a big thing for me uh I think a lot of it's got to do with I just don't believe children can look after themselves. Well, they're helpless, they go out, aren't they, without they us? Helpless. Without us. So how does a, you know, a parent, I know there are circumstances that lead people into poverty. I do mm. understand that. Mm. And I'm not here to solve any issues. I'm just here to maybe facilitate and help. So um, I just think the children are always, you know, the ones that suffer in the end too. And they can't go out and get a job and they can't go out and fend for themselves. No. So that's where my, the, I said, if I was to do anything for charities, it would be for children. There were three prongs for me, three yep. prongs. One is feeding hungry children. Mm -hmm. The other one is shelter mm -hmm. for homeless children who leave home because of circumstances that are beyond their control. Um, and uh, my third one is to do with helping children who have got illnesses, whether it's cancer, brain cancer, leukaemia, mm -hmm. um, and helping their parents to deal with those things and maybe bringing in some light and joy into their lives. Mm. Um, so they're the three kind of categories that we're looking for for Tea House, mm. and it's led us to where we are now. Yeah. And my first product was the mother and child apron. So yeah, twin set. I don't know if you've seen the cute little twin set. Um, and all money goes to this fabulous charity, Eat Up Australia. So tell me more about Eat Up Australia. One in five children experience food insecurity. So how do they actually help these kids? To, is it is it food donations? Is it packed lunches? How do they help? So Eat Up Australia was um, started by a young man by the name of Lyndon in 2013. He lived in Shepparton and he uh, he was 25 years old and he came home to visit his mum and he read in the paper that kids were going hungry at school and that school teachers were making lunches and school principals were buying lunches for kids. 
uh, because of whether it was farming or, you know, you know, poverty, who knows. Um, so he felt really bad. So apparently went and raided his mum's pantry oh. and uh, went and bought a whole bunch of loaves and made all these lunches and was taking them into school. And after a week, the school said, have you got any more? Because it's not just a one-day thing. It, it's continuous, oh, you know. It's a, it's a thing. So Lyndon founded that. That's where he started. Believe it or not, they service over 610 schools around Australia. They have trucks in Victoria, New South Wales, Queensland, Northern Territory and WA. There are only full, two full-time people that work on this and 14 volunteers. He's been very fortunate that he's had a truck that's been given to him by uh, trucks by Deliveroo. He's got a wow. couple of sponsorships very little government funding um food bank do help him occasionally um and all his bread has been donated by goodman field out through colds mm. so he's very very fortunate to get the bread but he has to fundraise to buy the cheese the butter the, the gloves the glad wrap um all that sort of stuff they don't even have refrigeration they beg borrow companies have you got spare refrigeration so what they do is they go into corporations they will say can you give us one hour of your time they sit there and they might make 1500 sandwiches they wrap them up they put them into refrigeration and the next day those guys go out to schools and they put them in give them to the tuck shops and the tuck shop freezes the sandwiches so right. they're generally cheese sandwiches only at this stage because they freeze well and mm. then when a kid comes to the school so the school's very discreet about how they let the tuck shop know usually it's embarrassing know, for children yeah it be can you imagine? yeah yeah or being bullied can you imagine mm. like being a you know a six-year-old because six-year-olds don't know where's no. your lunch where's your lunch box yeah um so apparently teachers kind of know which children need lunch. So they are given a little ticket. They go to the tuck shop and they get to a toasted sandwich. So the principals are very involved. There are a lot of schools. Believe it or not, they're even in South Melbourne. South Melbourne, which you think is Yeah, like, it's uh, quite an know, affluent area. There is definitely one in eight that go to school hungry. There is one in five they call food insecurities, which means that they might go to school on Monday with lunch, but on Tuesday or Wednesday or towards the end of the week, so when parents run out of money before they get their mm. paycheck on Friday, it might be Thursday, Friday, they've got no lunch. And the parents will say, well, you've had breakfast, you'll have dinner later. But how do you concentrate at school yeah. when you've got nothing in your tummy and you run around? And, and they're growing. Yeah. And they're growing, as you know. And all they get at the moment is just a toasty sandwich. Mm. So the whole idea of this was, so I, I approached um, Eat Up and said, so can we partner with you? We want to make this apron campaign, which is obviously fairly relevant to it, and all profits, all gross profits go to them. My purpose was not just to sell these aprons. My purpose is actually to make a bit of noise in the media. Um, mm. Not so much. This is not about Tea House. This is about me using my platform, which is an entertainment and, you know, information platform, but to produce product and also give him a bit of a voice and mm. get him out there so that I'm hoping that if enough people hear about it, someone might come up and say, I know someone who's got a cheese factory. I reckon they'll give you cheese for free. Yeah. Or I know someone who's got, um, you know, makes muesli bars. What can we do to help you? Or, you know, like to give kids maybe a recess piece of something. Mm. Um, so if we're making, if we're all making enough noise and we make it known that this is actually an issue, then we can get something done. So... That is where, you know, Eat Up do their work. They do an amazing job servicing um, 610 schools with so few people. So they basically are just feeding hungry school kids. Which is extremely um, important. Extremely. And especially when the numbers, the fact that we don't have JobKeeper anymore, yep. they do worry that the numbers go up. So this term, second term, they've got 42 extra schools. Wow. 42. So that's a lot of schools to kind of add. So, and a lot of them are in farming areas, mm. which is really sad. So, yeah, that's basically what Eat Up do. And, and our little thing is just trying to create a bit of noise, a bit of awareness, and, and buy a, a gift for Mother's Day or a gift for a friend or well, it doesn't be Mother's Day, it can be anything. Yeah. But at least it's a gift that gives back, which is really how I look at it. And that's where a tea house will be all about. It's not the only thing we're going to do. This is just not a one-off thing. We're doing a lunchbox campaign for them. We're designing a lunchbox. The idea is that we have about two or three products per charity. And even when we finish this event, 
they'll still be on our merchandise list and people yeah. can still go buy it. That money will always go back to Eat Up and then we'll move on to our next charity and we will do something for them um, and design a different product and then that will be their product that we design yeah. for them. So that's my little contribution. At 60, I've decided to do something as crazy as this and, and very consuming, but I've got to tell you, extremely fulfilling. Yeah. Extremely. I'm going to finish off with one little story. I've got to tell you the story. And it came to me. So my dad passed away in 2019. And as I said on, he was a very big influence in my life. Mm. Uh, Anyway, I, when I was five years old, I went to school, not learning, not knowing a word of English. I grew up in an area called Balmain. Yeah. And, And my parents, my dad used to work two jobs. He was a carpenter during the day. And he would always, my mum would drop me off at school and she'd go work as a seamstress. And my dad would pick me up in the afternoon after mm-hmm. he'd finished being a carpenter. He'd come home, cook dinner, and then he would go and do, he would go clean factories and he ended up having a cleaning business. So that was how hard he used to work. Yeah. So he worked pretty hard for his money. And they used to make me these sandwiches. Now, my sandwiches were not tea sandwiches or Vegemite sandwiches. My sandwiches <laughs> were things like mortadella, mm. you know, like grilled vegetables I used to have a passion for anchovies oh. so I didn't get those sort of I got smelly sandwiches at school and I remember when I was at school five and I got picked on oh. for having these smelly sandwiches well that's just kids you know kids yeah can be cool, as we all know but they were probably just going oh poo what are you eating and so eventually because I couldn't speak a lot of I couldn't defend myself like I can now yeah <laughs> So I would walk in and where we lived, we used to have the houses were built on sandstone and they had little holes in them to have the air flowing through. Yeah. And I used to walk past there and throw my sandwiches underneath there, throw them away. Because oh, I used to get in trouble if I didn't eat my sandwiches, but you weren't allowed to throw them away at school because parents, uh, teachers were obviously supervising the school mm. playground. Well, my dad caught me one day. Well, I, all I can say is I got into really big trouble, probably <laughs> the biggest trouble I've ever had in my whole life. Wow. And my dad was, you know, worked really hard to put food on the table and to get yeah, it. Yeah. Head. And I remember my dad shoveling all these sandwiches out of underneath the house, bucket loads. I imagine and what they smelt like then when they'd been. Can you imagine? <laughs> can you imagine? And, yeah, I got into really big trouble is all I can say. And uh here I am now when I started doing this journey it didn't come to me but one day I'm in the car and it just the whole story hit me and here I am now all these years I'm trying to make a witness to feed kids at school and I used to throw mine away (laughs) so I don't know what the universe you've come full circle (laughs) I have come Full circle. So sorry, I had to throw that little story. That's a beautiful story. Even I, even I laugh about it. And I think, oh my God, did I really do that? Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of She Does This. If you've enjoyed this episode, please rate, review and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to support Tea House and the amazing work Tina's doing, I will leave all the links you need in our show notes. Have an amazing week.